Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's webinar, Silicon Carbide, the Future of Power Electronics, brought to you by Tech Online, Wolf Speed, a Cree company, Arrow, and broadcast by Aspen Core. I'm Chris Keach, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few brief announcements before we begin. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the green folder icon located at the bottom of your screen. You can participate in our Q&A session by asking questions at any time during this webinar. Just type your question into the Q&A text area located to the right of the presentation window and then click the Submit button. Please note that we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have left at the end of today's program. However, if we're unable to get to your question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. Also at this time, we recommend that you disable your computer's pop-up blockers. This will allow the slides to advance automatically throughout the event. And at the end of the webinar, we'll ask you to complete our feedback form. Your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. You can also launch the survey at any time by clicking on the red survey button at the bottom of your console. And if you're experiencing any technical problems, please type your issue into the Q&A text area, and we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now, on to the presentation. Silicon Carbide, the future of power electronics. Discussing today's topic is Guy Moxie, Senior Director of Power Products, Wolf Speed, a Cree company. Guy Moxie has spent his entire career in the power semiconductor industry with various roles in applications, product marketing, and product line management. His career has included employment at International Rectifier, Siliconics, and Fairchild Semiconductor. It's with great pleasure I now turn this special session over to Guy to begin. Guy, take it away. Chris, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for attending and listening in to the first in a series of what will be uh, a very educational walkthrough, Silicon Carbide, and how Wolfspeed is enabling that market space. This is the first of, I believe, six um, webinars. So today we're going to walk through, in a relatively high level, what is silicon carbide, some of the fundamentals around it, where, where Wolfspeed comes into play, and some of the key applications that we've seen over the last series of years that really have embraced this new disruptive technology and the reasons why it's so effective. Um, going along... We'll also be having uh, three polls um, throughout the presentation. This will uh, keep it interactive. Um, your questions, the questions are pretty high level, but your answers will be very valuable in not only our studies, but uh, steering the rest of the, uh, the webinar series. So I shall begin. So silicon carbide, powering the future. So we're gonna jump straight into a poll just to get a grounding of where everyone is. And I believe we're it's about 30 seconds of easy answering. Do you feel that silicon carbide will be the choice semiconductor material for all high power and high voltage power designs? So it's a multiple choice. You have a, a choice of three. So if you would uh, be so good to answer them, and we will go through and see what the, uh, the results are. Ready now? Maybe it's not clear to me. Or no, I think it will not. Results are in. So do you feel that silicon carbide will be the choice semiconductor material for all high power and high voltage designs? 37% absolutely agree. Thank you very much. You must be the converts. It's ready now. 52% maybe, but it's not clear. And then a 10% said no, I think it will not. So a very balanced reply. Thank you for everyone for, for being honest. And this will obviously help steer our direction in the course of these series of webinars. So, moving forward, what is silicon carbide? So everyone has the same understanding, so we're all on the same page. Obviously, it's a semiconductor-based material. In actual fact, there's some interesting little uh, connotations behind this. Silicon carbide is not a naturally occurring substance. It actually was first discovered from a meteorite, from debris from a meteorite. Um, so what you see today is synthetic made silicon carbide. We've been perfecting this art for the last 30 something years at Cree. And we literally take sand and coal effectively at one end of our uh, factory. And out the other end comes the silicon carbide ball after passing through an incredible amounts of steps and heat and processing. 
So this is not a naturally occurring substance. We then take that ball, slice and process and polish, add epitaxy, and then fabricate. And what do we fabricate? We fabricate bare dye. We fabricate discrete shockies, shocky dye as that is, and power MOSFETs. And we take those MOSFETs and shockies and put them into discrete packages or modules. Okay. And why? Why do we do this? It's not just for fun. We've determined through 30 years of working with this substance that done correctly and used correctly, we can achieve incredibly high power version, uh, conversion capability versus incumbent silicon. We can increase switching speeds, which reduces loss and passive components. And we have in improved thermal performance from the material itself. Three fundamental advantages that silicon carbide can bring. But what does, what does that mean? What does that mean to the end application, to the design community? If done correctly, and I will keep stressing, if done correctly, we can reduce loss or system level loss of the converter or inverter by up to 50 to 80%. We can reduce the size or increase power density, both equal the same thing, by three to four times under the right circumstances. And overall system efficiency can be improved by several percent, thus lowering entire system losses. So this is why silicon carbide is a disruptive technology against silicon, but it's gaining so much traction into the market today. So just after that first introductory slide, we're going to have our second poll. Because I keep mentioning disruptive technologies, wide band gap technologies in particular, and there are two or three different types of wide band gap material around in the market today. So our second set of questions, do you feel that silicon carbide and gallium nitride are competing technologies? Yes, they are very similar. Maybe, but it's not clear. Or no, I don't think they are competing. So we're really establishing here what people think about the two main types of wide band gap material as a disruptive technology against silicon. Yes, they are very similar. Maybe, could be, could not be. Or no, I don't think they really compete. So let's have a look at the answers. Thank you for participating. So silicon carbide versus gallium nitride in some cases. Yes. 26%, roughly a quarter of everyone said, yes, they are very similar. Yes, they're wide banger. That's true. A good third of the people said, no, um, they're not competing. And then the rest, which is about a third again, said maybe, but it's not too clear. So again, a good widespread uh, spectrum of results. So why? Let's try and answer some of the questions. Why is the industry moving to silicon carbide? In particular, the biggest transformation is coming from the automotive industry. Automotive OEMs have invested over $350 billion in the last year or so in electrification of vehicles. And silicon carbide is their material of choice. Automotive, as we all know, demands not only highest performance, but quality and supply chain and reliability. Hence, the market of silicon carbide, the supplier base in particular, Wool Speed, are implementing their AECQ 101 qualified series of devices to satisfy this need. So why is the automotive industry embracing silicon carbide against the incumbent of silicon? Bomb savings are a significant item in any vehicle. An electric car is huge. So we're talking about batteries. Batteries is the, mo are, is the most expensive item within a car. And by implementing silicon carbide, and we've taken this directly from Goldman Sachs, we know this information ourselves and we've quantified it, but it's always nice to quote an independent party. Battery costs can be reduced by 300 to $600 US dollars per car by implementing silicon carbide. Why is this? I mentioned about massive reduction in inverter losses 
and this is very applicable to this situation. If you drive a, a car, an electric car, with silicon, it's really optimized. The, 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 drive, the drivetrain is optimized around full load capability. Well, we all know, unless you've stolen the car, you're really just driving between medium speed and low speed for most of the time. And this is where across that drive cycle, as they call it, silicon carbide is more efficient than silicon IGBT. So if you look at the combined city and highway drive cycle, OEMs have proven by implementing silicon carbide, they can reduce the losses of that inverter by up to 80%. Now, I'm just going to dwell on that phrase, 80%. If you've been in the power electronics business for a while, you get very excited about 0.8 of a percent efficiency change, for example, of a power supply. If someone said you, you changed the, the game by 8%, you'd be quite suspicious. But 80% is just phenomenal. And that is across that drivetrain. So what does that give us? What does it really give us? It means for the same battery size and cost, you can have extended range. Or let's flip it around the other way. For the same range, you can reduce the size and the cost of the battery. So the small value add of bringing silicon carbide into the drivetrain from a pricing perspective is considerably outweighed by the result of the battery savings or the range. Space as well. Now, Goldman Sachs have got various complicated algorithms to work this through, but they computed that uh, silicon carbide can achieve six, up to $600 per car of space savings. Now, it's quite difficult to quantify space savings, but as you can imagine, when we increase power density and reduce battery size, this is what contributes to that figure. And also, when you reduce loss, you reduce the need for some of the cooling. So this reduces the burden on the car's cooling system, and that, according to Goldman Sachs, equates to 500 to 1,000 US dollars per car. Now, obviously, different cars have different power ratings, and that's where you get the different scales from. But this just shows you what difference silicon carbide can make in the right application. Reduce battery weight, reduce the components through systems, and reduce the heat. So we see this now with automotive driving the onboard motor drive, the drivetrain or the inverter, also the onboard charger. And if you equate automotive to offboard charging as well, they make dramatic differences in offboard charging. So not all of us touch automotive. There is a broad industrial and energy and many other markets out there. But the key thing to this piece of information is when the automotive industry adopts a technology. They adopt it because it's the right technology and it's reliable. But what it's going to give to the overall market is going to drive huge economy of scale, which other segments can benefit from. Talking about off-board charging, which some people class as the industrial market, these are the fast charging stations you see. These are not the, uh, the small AC chargers that one is, has in their garages overnight. These are the fast charging stations that very uh, supportive employers put in their car parks to charge your car during the daytime. What we do here, these are basically the target of a fast charger is to, is to implement the charge in under 30 minutes, generally speaking. So this is DC charged straight bypassing the onboard charger of the car straight into the battery. Typically, the 80 to 150 kilowatts, they look very much the size of a, of a petrol or gas pump you see today. But inside, they're actually uh, framed up very much like a server station. They are built up of several racks of 20 kilowatt blocks. That's how they're typically, typically constructed. And what's the difference here? What are people looking for? Obviously, it's energy efficiency, it's size, it's cost, and it's reliability. So implementing silicon carbide against silicon in the AC to DC section, which is the PS three-phase PFC, and then the DC to DC section, we can reduce losses, overall system losses, by 30%, and we can increase power density considerably. So we can make fast charging stations, smaller, faster, and better.
just another example of silicon carbide being adopted that you see around you today. If you remember the first poll, will silicon carbide be the um, technology for the future of high power? And some people were not sure. It's amazing when you look around where you see silicon carbide affecting you on a daily basis. Moving to a different segment, and moving to an energy segment, a very, very, very uh, int interesting segment and a high growth segment, solar and energy storage. This has been a favorite for silicon carbide for many years because of the efficiency in space. And what we see, this is a typical example, and we like to relate to real life examples. If you take a typical 50 or 60 kilowatt inverter, a boost converter and inverter, by implementing silicon carbide, you can increase the switching frequency by two to three times compared to silicon, which then reduces your magnetics down considerably. So what does that give you? It gives you a huge space saving, but it also gives you a significant cost saving as well. On all to boot, you can increase the system level efficiency by over 1%. So smaller, lighter, more efficient. And where, let's think of again, a realistic practical application. And these, the, the pictures you can see are true scale. This is a 50 kilowatt uh, string inverter system. The silicon version is on the right hand side and it's the size of a typical sort of office filing cabinet and it weighs considerably more. Implementing silicon carbide for exactly the same functionality, you can reduce that size down to something that you would check in at an airport um, terminal. And so you can see not only the weight, but the size. And to boot, it's more efficient. Moving to another example, again, we're trying to relate things to what you see on a daily basis. Let's take the, the IT industry, the enterprise industry. This has been the long-time server for silicon carbide since probably 2008. We have Energy Star efficiency regulations coming into play and very strongly into play, which is a great thing. And what that has done, that has forced the power supplies to be more efficient and reach certain standards. And when uh, you, you're acquired to reach a certain standard, sometimes silicon cannot achieve it. And now we've gone through bronze, silver, gold, Energy Star 80 plus platinum. Now we're on to titanium standards. We're basically tapped out of what silicon can achieve. The uh, platinum gold standard incorporated silicon carbide diodes in the boost PFC because of the very low recovery loss, which added to the efficiency. And now we're coming into titanium we're having to redesign the complete system away from a two-level interleave boost, for example, into a totem pole topology, where you're actively using the body diode of the silicon carbide MOSFET to do reverse conduction. So this is a yet another example of how silicon carbide is affecting people and the industry today. And a simple little circuit that covers a multitude of applications is another great place to look. We've talked about onboard and onboard charging and automotive inside of EVs. We'll talk about offboard charging. We've walked briefly through the solar industry. But when you look at the broad industrial market, motor drives, solar inverters, industrial equipment, manufacturing equipment, robotics, for example, they all have their main power path. But what's behind that? What's powering the micro and the auxiliary power for any one of these systems? Generally speaking, it's an auxiliary power supply. So what we do here, if it's fed from a three-phase input, it's a high-voltage power supply. If you're approaching silicon, you have to do it two-level. If you approach silicon carbide, now we stretch it to 1,700 volts. We go up to a flyback, so we can simplify design. So this is not necessarily about increasing efficiency. This is about design simplification with silicon carbide. So we can increase efficiency across the systems we enable. We can reduce size. We can reduce cooling. And we can simplify the design of the circuit. And this is typically across any type of application, as I mentioned, that takes a high-voltage input 
and turns out the low voltage output to power the auxiliary power supply. And this is 60 watts, 200 watts, 300 watts. This is not necessarily what we would all think of as high power. It's high voltage for sure, but it's not necessarily high power. So let's bring it back into wolf speed a little bit more. So we've talked about what is silicon carbide very briefly, and in the next series of, Web, of, of WebExes we'll go through in more detail the silicon carbide technology itself, we'll go through the devices, and then we'll go through in more depth respective applications, and we'll broaden out the applications. We don't want to spend the entire series of webinars talking about automotive, as exciting as that is, but we want to incorporate a lot more industrial and energy applications where the value proposition in silicon carbide has been adopted. But just to dwell back on wolf speed, you know, we've been enabling this market for, for 30 years, along with, with LEDs and power and RF, all based on silicon carbide material. We are the largest manufacturer of base wafers and base material in the world. And then we, epitax, we add epitaxy and we fabricate ourselves. And we've been doing this purely for the same reasons, to increase efficiency, to increase switching frequency where applicable and when applicable, improve the thermal performance of the device, the circuit, the system, and give higher reliability. Really, and back to the gallium nitride question, you know, how does silicon carbide and gallium nitride work? We really start at 600 volts. We actually go from 600 volts up to 10 kV in our product portfolio. So any power supply design, AC to DC, DC to DC, DC to AC, potentially can work through the benefits of silicon carbide. We have number one market share in the devices, and we are doubling capacity year on year. We've all seen this adoption. We've gone through why the market is adopting silicon carbide. Part of the answer is in having enough supply to enable that adoption, and we are investing incredibly heavily in this area. We invented the silicon carbide MOSFET. So let's talk about reliability. We mentioned automotive has to have incredibly high levels of reliability, but so does all other systems as well. You know, this is not necessarily a, a low-end consumer market product. We now, and this was actually charted in the summer of last year, so we're regaining these figures um, this year to, to update, but the summer, as of the summer of last year, we clocked six trillion field hours of product. Six trillion. Now, yes, compared to silicon that's been around for 70 years, six trillion is not an incredible amount. The silicon carbide realistically has been commercialized for the last eight to 10 years. So six trillion field hours of product out there is incredible. This backs up that reliability. And why is automotive adopting silicon carbide? Because now it is reliable. Six plus years of MOSFETs and 17 years of diodes. This spans something like 80 to 90 product parts across die, discrete, and modules, and thousands of customers using this product in the field. And with the embracing of automotive comes the required standards to support it. So silicon carbide with AECQ 101 and PPAPs. And also as well, we're getting to the stage where we're optimizing technology and we're looking at markets like the energy market where you need outdoors and high reliability and high humidity. So we're implementing optimized quality feature sets and reliability feature sets around that too. So just to give you an example of, of living a day in silicon carbide relating to the material we've gone through, I was in China probably three weeks ago. And wake up in the morning, everyone jumps on their email. First thing you do, normally about four o'clock in the morning because the jet lag has woken you up. Those IT, your, your enterprise servers are powered by silicon carbide. Then on the train, going from city A to city B. That train, the auxiliary power supply supplying the carriage, lights, air conditioning, Wi-Fi, et cetera, et cetera. The auxiliary power converter, 200 kilowatt converter, was powered by silicon carbide. 
as I was speeding from city A to city B, looking out of the window, you could see all the solar implementation across the towns and the villages and the, the industry. Those solar panels, the string inverters, the inverters and the boost inverters are powered by silicon carbide. Another example of where it touches people today. And then finally, get off at the train station, jump in a taxi, happens to be in the electrical taxi, and that is implemented by silicon carbide. So four examples in one day of where silicon carbide is in the market. So we're not talking about this as a technology that could be. We're not talking about it's a science project or, or when will it happen. It's happened already today. And it's surprising how much it touches everybody's life on a daily basis. If you want to learn more, obviously follow the next series of webinars. But absolutely, please look at our respective websites. Arrow and Wolfspeed are partnering in this venture. So visit wolfspeed.com or arrow.com to find out more, far more information. So just finally, we're finishing on a, the third poll. So bearing in mind what we've talked about, we've talked about really what it is, why it's being adopted in the market, what it can bring. We'll hopefully try to be pretty balanced in where it goes and why it doesn't go and how it has to be used. And there are other technologies around. So what do you feel is the largest barrier to silicon carbide adoption in your designs? I'm unsure of how to use it in my designs. It's too expensive. I can't get the parts or other. Four choices there. So what do you feel is the largest barrier to silicon carbide adoption in your designs? I'm unsure how to use it. It's too expensive. Part availability or other. So let's have a quick look at the answers. 15%, I'm unsure how to use it in my design. That's actually a good thing to see, the relatively low percentage, which means people understand what the product is, what the technology does, and through their own education and the support of suppliers are learning how to use it. I'm sure there's lots of other barriers going forward, but this is where we'll cover those in the following webinars. Ah, 51% said it's too expensive. That's something we hear on a fairly regular basis for sure. But in the following webinars, we will go through and we'll walk you through the applications of where silicon carbide is being adopted. And yes, it will be slight price premium compared to silicon, which I agree with. But when you incorporate it properly and correctly, it can enable significant reduction in system level costs. So we try and uh, avoid looking at component versus component, but we look at changing systems and improving systems to reduce overall system bond. But it's a valid answer. Part availability. Yes, that's an interesting one. We know uh, this market has exploded in the last two to three years. We know why, the main reasons why the IT enterprise industry adopted it and then very quickly the energy solar market adopted it and now recently the automotive market is adopting silicon carbide. So this is demanding a considerable amount of wafer starts. So yes, it's been pretty challenging from I think all the suppliers recently due to the demand. But uh, as I mentioned before, we've taken this very seriously and we are investing heavily year on year on year to get capacity in line to satisfy the market needs. And 18.6% of people said other. So maybe uh, I'm hoping that people have been tapping away on the questions as we've gone through this webinar to see what uh, some of the other barriers to entry are. So with that, it was fairly brisk and brief. And it's come in at around about half an hour. So I wanted to leave time for, for Q&A afterwards. And I will say that uh, obviously in the following webinar series, we will be going through in much more detail what the products and technologies really are, how it's designed, what its pros and cons are, how it fits into some applications. There are some applications where it doesn't fit as well. So we will be very happy to go through those. This is not a solution that will save the world at all. 
but this is a very disruptive technology that brings significant value to certain areas of the power electronics industry. So from that, I'm going to open it up to the questions, and let's see what we have. And I think, Chris, are you going to moderate through the questions? Absolutely, Guy. Thank you, Guy, for a great presentation. As a reminder, please fill out the feedback form that will open up at the end of the show. Thank you in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in this survey allows us to better serve you. We're now going to move on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in our Q&A session, just type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window or click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and then click the Submit button. Please note, we'll try to get to as many as we can here in the time that we have left. If we don't get to your question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. So let's get started with some questions here. So I've got a few questions for you, Guy. Uh, you mentioned there are future webinars focusing on applications. Can you let us know what type of applications you will cover? Yes, yeah, sure. What we're actually going to do is center around, um, first and foremost, circuit topologies because there are thousands of different applications when you look at industrial, slightly fewer when you're looking at energy and within automotive, you know, there's only one or two or three. So we approach this by topology. When we talk about an AC to DC, we talk about a three phase, we talk about a single phase, we talk about a butt, we talk about a boost. And then we broaden that out into the most um, industrial and energy applications that are applicable. Yes, there'll be different voltages and different current, current levels and different power, but the fundamental core topologies are very similar. So what we're going to focus on is walking you through the core topologies and then applying them to the broad applications that fit. All right, thank you, Guy. Another question here for you says, do you expect it to move into lower voltage applications? Um, I think the answer to that is no. Silicon carbide really wakes up and gets out of bed at 600 volts. Yes, it can be applicable to three, 300 volt uh, synchronous rectification in shock keys, but realistically, the, the value and the performance is really seen from 600 volts through to broad industrial up to 1700 volts. And then if you get a little bit more specialist, but uh, quite scary power levels of 3.3, 6.5 and, and 10 kV, that's where we really come into uh, to, to topping out the voltage. So realistically, 600 volts to 10 kV is the, is the, the span for silicon carbide. All right, thank you, Guy. Another question asks, I heard the EMC performance is not so good for silicon carbide uh, due to high frequency. So how can we solve this? Yes, it, it's like anything in life. There's always, a pro, there's always a pro and a con. There's always a compromise. You improve something, and it tends to have a knock-on effect. So, yes, the silicon carbide has very fast um, rates of switching, very fast rise times and falls times, and, of course, that can have an impact on, on the EMI and EMC. And some applications, it's very, let's, let's rephrase this, it's very easy to say, yes, let's all switch at one megahertz, but the practical impl implications will not allow you to do that. So what we do, we look at the respective topologies if it's soft switched, it obviously has a consideration. If it's hard switched, it's very much a consideration. Yes, we have lower reverse recovery. We talk about in some of the webinars later on, we'll be going through how we uh, soften the switching, how we add snubbers, how we implement RG, on-chip and off-chip, all to focus around the rise times and the fall times of these switches in particular, because I totally understand that it can have noise implications. All right, thank you, Guy. Another question here for you asks, why is silicon carbide uh, and not uh, gallium nitride the material of choice for automakers? Um, I think many ways you could look at this. Reliability is one that keeps hitting us for silicon carbide, that is. You know, if an automotive maker is going to adopt a new technology, it's got to be reliable. So we, you know, we prove our own reliability, six trillion field hours, AECQ qual, um, extended lifetime testing, um, but, and I don't know how gallium nitride is approaching that. Also, I think when you look at power level of, of automotive as well, I think it's very different from a two kilowatt DC to DC supplying your lights and, a, and, and you know, infotainment compared to a 6.6 .6 to 22 kilowatt onboard charger. Then you, when you overlay that with 150 kilowatt 
an above motor drive, I think really the, each technology has its own strengths and weaknesses across those different approaches. So I'm not going to say you know, gallium nitrite is the wrong thing to approach. I think gallium nitrite has some good fundamental uh, capability. But the question we get asked is, is it reliable? Is it rugged? Is it robust? And we can answer all three of those. All right. Thank you, Guy. Another one here for you says, does silicon carbide make sense in a super uh, cost-sensitive market, such as motor drive inverters or, H or in the HVAC industry? You got to look at the value proposition. Um, as I described earlier on, you know, the automotive industry is adopting it because really it's all about battery savings and space and, and system cost. The IT industry have embraced it due to increasing efficiency and legislation. I think the toughest um, approach for silicon carbide is when you've got a, uh, a very low cost grid fed um, system that's running at full power continuously. I mentioned about the, the motor drive in a car and the drive cycle is mostly low power. So we are more efficient than the incumbent silicon. If you've got a motor drive that's turning a conveyor belt for 24 hours a day, constant power, then an IGBT is probably designed and is, is the right choice at the moment. But going forward, and you know, cost comes into silicon carbide question all the time, as we improve our technology for performance, we improve our technology for costs, we drive economy of scale and adoption, then our cost roadmaps for silicon carbide will become increasingly more competitive against this sort of lower cost entrenched silicon. All right, thank you, Guy. Another one says, uh, will there be more in-depth webinars on silicon carbide and gallium nitride technology? Absolutely, there will. Very good question. You know, this was a fairly um, high-level intro into the next, I think, five or six um, series. The next ones uh, will be going through the device technology themselves. We're going through the, some sections on reliability and how we quantify and look at reliability. And then we'll be going into the true application and, and system level um, sections where, again, we go into uh, topology evaluations. This will purely be silicon carbide. You know, Wolf Speed is a Cree company, and we build our product on silicon carbide. Just an interesting side note, we produce a tremendous amount of GAN as well, but this is not GAN for power. We choose to put our GAN on silicon carbide for lower voltage, high power RF applications. All right, thank you, Guy. Another question asks, uh, or actually states, I'm mostly familiar with GAN technology. What are some significant differences between GAN and silicon carbide from the design perspective? I think fundamentally, you know, both being wide band gap, they both potentially can bring some of the same uh, value proposition to the table of higher switching speed where applicable um, and, and driving efficiency. But I think the difference being between silicon carbide and GAN from what we see is the application we focus on. We're not necessarily focusing on megahertz applications. They tend to be lower power, lower voltage, you know, consumer driven applications where size and, and compactness of cell phone chargers, for example, are paramount. But when you're looking at a 250 kilowatt drive for a, uh, a, a large European automobile, then uh, we focus on obviously reduce, reduction of losses and saving battery count. So there are some very some significant differences in the technology, and that will be touched a little bit later on. Um, but from a design perspective, some of the fundamentals are similar, but I think it's the applications they go into make the, uh, the difference in choice. And I get asked this question a lot, you know, does GAN compete with silicon carbide? Does silicon carbide compete with GAN? And I realistically say no, both of them compete with silicon. And realistically, a lot of them, again, and silicon carbide can be looked at as complementary technologies. I think there's, a, there's an interesting space in the lower voltage, lower power area for very high switching frequency uh, product against uh, silicon. And there's a very large market for higher power, higher voltage product against uh, incumbent IGBTs and so forth. All right, thank you, Guy. I uh, have another question here for you that says, at an architectural level, are there differences when designing with silicon carbide ver power versus uh, silicon power? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I highlighted some of them very briefly, but um, the, the following webinars will definitely go into more detail. Realistically, a lot of it is about change of approach of architecture. Silicon would be traditional in a, in a three-phase PFC as a multi-level PFC because of the limitations of voltage, for example. We would come in and say, no, let's simplify that circuit design and do a two-level AFE. Um, if you look at IGBT, very happily switching at 10 to 20 kilohertz, we would come in and say, right, let's redesign this circuit at 200 kilohertz and reduce down your input filters and your magnetics. So very rarely do you unplug a device that is silicon, whether it be a MOSFET or an IGBT, and just directly plug in a, a silicon carbide transistor. Normally, to get the maximum benefit of silicon carbide for the overall system, it requires some redesign and approach. And of course, we need to implement the according gate drivers and passive components that go along with this change of design. All right, thank you, Guy. Uh, another one asks here, uh, I struggled over the past year on silicon carbide lead times. Uh, what's your capacity outlook? <laughs> Yes, we, we, were, we were, I think the whole market for silicon carbide and us being the market leader were, were in very high demand for the last 18 months. Um, and yes, it, uh, it's something that we've taken very seriously. If uh, anyone's caught any of our investor um, webinars with our CEO, Greg Lowe, he's been very detailed in, in outlining our, our capacity plans that have been because we started uh, increasing capacity from 2016, and we carry on investing significantly to increase capacity through the next several years. You know, silicon carbide adoption is not just a, b a boom and a bust. This is a 10 to 20 year implementation. And you think you know, we solve the pollution level at, at, at cars on the road, but then those cars need charging. That energy needs generating. And so then we move upscale and upstream to the power distribution and power generation. You think this is a multi-year opportunity of, of bringing significant improvement into electronic systems, but we have to have the capacity to support it. Thank you, Guy. Another question here asks, uh, any major cons of silicon carbide from, uh, say, an, an assembly perspective? Um, it's not the same as silicon. I think, as I mentioned right at the start of the presentation, the fundamental uh, cornerstone is the material itself, which is incredibly um, complicated to manufacture. We have been doing it for 30 years, and hence we're the market leader in that. But then the fabrication itself also has some, some differences from silicon. So all in all, it's not a cut and paste from a, uh, from a silicon perspective directly implementing to silicon carbide. So there are, some, there are some cons. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of heat across the complete uh, you know, manufacturing chain, for example. But this is something that we've conquered for the last 30 years. So we've cracked it. We've got the secret sauce. All right, thank you, Guy. What's the uh, largest application or market for silicon carbide? I think, well, traditionally uh, it was server and enterprise. That was the beginnings of silicon carbide. And as I mentioned, the energy segment came in and embraced silicon carbide, the Europeans uh, and then the Asians in, in solar and, and energy storage. And now, realistically, for the last two years, We've seen the adoption into automotive, predominantly in, in the onboard charger, which is the slightly lower power application. And now we're seeing the broad adoption into the drivetrain. So I think just from sheer content and demand, the automotive uh, industry is going to be the, uh, the Goliath. But that's going to drive incredible change within the industry that the industrial industry and the energy markets will adopt as well and use. All right, looks like we have a couple more questions here for you, Guy. Uh, any comment on a product ro roadmap? Yeah, absolutely. I deliberately steered away from drilling into uh, products and voltages and RDS-ons and VFs during this introductory uh, webinar. But we will cover, as we break through on the device level, we talk about the device technologies, part of that uh, webinar will be going through our wall speed uh, comprehensive roadmaps on, on DAI, on diodes, on MOSFET, 
and on modules as well. All right, thank you, Guy. Looks like we have time for just one final question here. Uh, can we see any demos or reference designs? Yes, absolutely. Part and parcel of enabling uh, the use of silicon carbide, and that's why it was interesting to see on the poll that quite a few people had started to understand how to use it, is doing exactly that, is the education on adoption. Again, it's not just taking out a silicon MOSFET and plopping in a silicon carbide MOSFET. It's sometimes a radical change in system topology to get the true benefit. So what we do, there's a lot of very clever design community out there for sure, and they know their systems better than we do. But what we've, what we've really focused on for the last four or five years at Wolfspeed is the key enabling topologies. We do evaluation kits, we do system level demos, we do architecture studies, we have white papers, we even have reference, you know, hardware reference designs that can be available for purchase. And, and Gerber files, builds of materials, all of these can be found on the Wolfspeed website in the tools and in the tools and support section, where you can see quite a, an expansive offering of even simple gate drivers through to simple switch half bridge boards through to full system level demo kits. We want people to understand how to use this and use it. And if we can save design time and design effort, that's the way we want to go. All right. Well, thank you, Guy. That is all the time that we have for questions for today. If we didn't get to your question, again, someone will get back to you after the program is over. And for more information related to today's webinar, please visit any of the resource links available in the green folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Once again, I'd like to thank Guy for a great presentation and Q&A session. And I'd like to thank our audience for attending today's webinar, Silicon Carbide, the future of power electronics, brought to you by Tech Online, Wolfspeed, a Cree company, and Arrow. This webinar is copyright 2019 by Aspen Core. The presentation materials are owned by our copyright by Tech Online and Wolfspeed, a Cree company, and the individual speaker is solely responsible for his content and opinions. On behalf of our guest and Wolfspeed, a Cree company, and Arrow, I'm Chris Keach. We'd like to thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again very soon.